It was bound to happen. <laughs> Might as well be today. We've got that one over, don't we? Uh, you know, when you look at these beautiful stained glass windows and you see the golden sunlight passing through them, it's hard to believe that there could be any kind of darkness in the world. Whenever I come into this room and see those windows, I always feel like everything is all right. If I'm having a rough time during the week or something has happened that uh, feels pretty heavy on my soul, I just come down and walk into this beautiful light, the beautiful wind came before us, one that symbolizes the word and the light of God's word, one through the lilies reflects and symbolizes resurrection, are powerful reminders of us, to us, that God loves us and God is always with us and God is always reaching out to us. But, as the Apostle Paul would say, but... There are those moments in life when we feel as if there is no light at all. There are those moments in life when we feel like the darkness has overwhelmed us, that we have been put in a place that is so deep and dark and desperate, we will never recover. And when I have one of those moments in my life, I don't know how you handle it, but I tend to call God in for a little bit of an evaluation of his work and say, Lord, I'm looking at what's going on here with COVID-19, conflict in the nation, a world that's turned upside down. Maybe you forgot your job description. Right? Maybe you left it on a desk. Heaven is huge. It's gigantic. Lots of gold probably blinds you. You may have left it laying around, so I think you need to read it again. There are those times when it's so crushing and hard and dark that we shout out and rail against God. I was started my ministry for the Methodist Church working at St. John's United Methodist Church as the director of children and youth ministries. And I was there for a long time and I had just an incredible and wonderful experience in that first church job. In fact, if I, if I hadn't had that great experience, I probably wouldn't have hung in there. That first church experience is so important when people are starting in professional ministry. It was just an incredible experience, and I loved the people, and uh, it was just a great match. I wasn't a pastor. I was working as a lay employee. One night in a Sunday night service, the preacher was preaching on calling, and I felt myself drawn to come down to the altar and God had laid it upon my heart to go to seminary. Wasn't real sure what seminary meant, or what all was involved, but I just felt like that's what I was called to do. So I called up the bishop, first time I'd ever talked to a Methodist bishop, talked to him for a few minutes about it, and he immediately got me appointed to a church. Now, I didn't want to be appointed to a church. I wasn't trained or prepared to be a pastor in any way, but he handed me a little piece of paper, the DS did, said, Congratulations, you're a pastor now, associate pastor of a church in Dallas. Apparently, sort of the same way Goober gets to be uh, a, a, a deputy sheriff occasionally on, on Mayberry, sort of the thing like that. And I felt about as equipped and able as Goober. I had left a church where, where I felt loved and where I felt purpose and, and just happiness for years, and I went to a church that was in deep conflict. Now, that church would become a huge blessing in my life and really shape who I was as a pastor, but that's not how it started. The church was integrating. The neighborhood was turning over, and there was nothing but conflict every single day. There were four of us pastors there, and that wasn't enough to handle what was going on. People were mad because we weren't integrating fast enough. People were mad because we were integrating too fast. People were upset because old institutions, UMW circles, and the way we did youth, all those things were changing. And any time you change things in the church, well, you know the pillars shake, right? People were walking in saying, take my name off the church roll. I don't want to be a member here anymore. People were calling up all day long. I was getting calls from people I'd never even met. I was brand new there. I was in my 20s, you know. People were calling me up and said, cancel my pledge. I'm never giving another penny to that church. I mean, it was just that kind of time. 
To make things worse, I had a terrible living arrangement. I was living in a duplex and, and didn't get along with my neighbor. He, we had a backyard that had a fence down. Even it was, our backyard was a duplex backyard. And his dogs and my dog didn't get along. It was that bad. We didn't get along. The dogs didn't get along. And I had this beautiful dog. Her, her purebred, her pedigree name was Dale's Morning Rose. And it was a beautiful name for a beautiful dog. I called her Rosie. She was a Brittany Spaniel. And if, you, if you've never had a Brittany, they're incredible. They're the, the best athletes probably in American dog world. So fast, beautiful, just athletic. They don't typically lick. They just nuzzle a lot. They just love to nuzzle and be up. I mean, they're just awesome dogs, right? One of our church members had bought this dog and paid a lot of money for it as a hunting dog, only to find out she was gun shy. And so they gave her to us, and we were delighted to have her as a pet. And no matter how bad things were going at church, no matter, matter how bad things were going, and how I just completely understood, misunderstood what Dallas was about, no matter how miserable I felt there, starting graduate school, struggling with all of that, I could come home to that dog. And I would take her out in the park. And we would just have these awesome times together. And then one night, for reasons that are still unexplained, my duplex neighbor just decided to open the gate and run her off forced her out into the streets of Dallas, Texas. About 11.30 that night, we got a call. A group of teenagers had found her. She'd been hit, and she was dying. And I went and held that little dog in my arms while she breathed her last breath, while her blood dripped over my hands. And I can remember going home and saying, God, God, you aren't getting this right at all. God, I was in a place where, where people loved me, a church that loved me, or I could have stayed forever. You sent me to this church that's nothing but a fight. You have sent me to seminary. I was a science major. I don't know Bonhoeffer from Boltman. These people are speaking a language I don't even understand. Give me numbers. Give me formulas. I'll be fine. But this theology stuff. Lord God, you, you put me in a place to, to live with somebody who hates me enough that they're responsible for killing my dog, my dog. God, you're just not getting any of this right. Don't you know, God, your job is to protect me, to keep me from harm, to keep me from ever feeling hurt, discomfort or unhappiness. And I'd like to tell you that in those moments, there was a shining light that came into the room and a wonderful warm voice that connected with me and lifted me up and affirmed me, but that is not what happened. That prayer, that conversation with God was met with stony silence. The next day, I went to see my senior pastor. Wallace Chapel is a very famous Methodist ministry. He's one of the giants of the Methodist church. He was well known for mentoring young pastors. He created the camping program we had back then, a hiking program, all kinds of things for young people to draw them to Christ. He was just an awesome guy. I told him this whole story that I was leaving his church. I wasn't ever coming back. I was going to go back into Oklahoma where people knew God and God knew people, where God roamed, because obviously God had nothing to do with Dallas and Texas. Right? And Wally said, he said, so you're like Jacob. You've come to that dark place and all you want to do is limp home. And I said, that's right. I'm going to limp home. And very quietly, Wally said, you know, that's not the end of Jacob's story. There's another chapter. Maybe you could think about giving God a little more time. When you read Genesis 32, 
It's bumfuzzling and confusing. It's strange and weird and just difficult to understand unless you've had a night, a day, a week, a month, or a year in your life where you just spent all of your energy saying, God, why are you letting this happen? God, why aren't you doing things better? God, I, I can tell you what you need to do. I'll get you straightened out if you'll just listen to me. The story starts off, you remember Jacob runs into, it says in some of your English Bibles, an angel. It's not what it says in the original Hebrew, it says Malachi, it's plural. He runs into a whole bunch of angels, which he interprets as a sign that God is in this place somehow. And Jacob's in such trouble that he doesn't even see that as a good thing. Remember, he, he, he stole from his brother Esau. He stole from his poor blind daddy. His mama said, Jacob, you better get out of here. So he's run off. He traveled and traveled, got to his uncle Laban, who was just as big a thief as he is, who robbed him and cheated him and mistreated him till he flipped it around on Laban. And he robbed and cheated and stole from Laban, finally ending up with Laban's daughters, Laban's grandchildren, Laban's servants, and a lot of Laban's livestock. And now he's run off from Laban. So he's caught in this place where to go one direction is to run into his brother Esau who has sworn to kill him. But to turn back and go the other way is to run into Laban. And their last scene, you may remember, Laban takes a bunch of little rocks and he makes a little wall, just a little tiny miniature wall, like maybe a little stone mountain you'd make for a train set. And he says, Jacob, this side of this wall is my half of the world. That side of the rocks, that's your half of the world. If you ever cross back over these rocks, I'm going to take care of you, sucker. So he, he's there on this riverbank, and he's trying to decide what to do. And the scouts come in, and they say, Jacob, we've been out, and we've been looking. Your brother Esau's coming to meet you. Well, that's good. No, that's not good. He's bringing an army of hundreds of men and they're looking for you. So Jacob makes this decision. He splits his family up into small groups. And then he gets a couple of groups and, and, and gives them gifts and says to the gift groups, go meet Esau. Give him these gifts. Maybe that'll distract him. And then he takes his family groups and says, you go off this way, you go off this way, you go off this way, you go off that way. Because maybe then if, if Esau comes, he'll find this one group and he'll kill them all and he'll be so tired he can't go chase these other groups. Maybe one or two of them will escape. And that's Jacob's life. It's come down to, it's not even safe for his children and his grandchildren to be around him. And as soon as everybody is gone, the scripture says, very pointedly, Jacob was alone. Now, it doesn't just mean there wasn't anybody around him physically. It means relationally and spiritually, he's all by himself. Like me sitting on the steps of my house in Dallas, wishing that dog was still alive. There are times in life when we are, just feel completely alone. And Jacob's having that moment. Now we remember that the once uh, uh, before, early in the Jacob story, he crossed a river. And, and when he did, God was there to take care of him and everything worked out. But Jacob can't remember any of that. All he can think about is how bad things are. And to make things worse, a stranger comes in the darkness and grabs him. And they start to wrestle. And they wrestle for hours. Now I can say wrestle because of where I'm from. You may say wrestle, but I say wrestle. Because when I was a little boy growing up in South Oklahoma City, if y'all have seen, ever seen the Ferris wheel that's there right on the river, I grew up just south of that Ferris wheel about three blocks. 
And, and on Friday nights, my dad would gather us all up, and we'd go down to the farmer's market, still there in Oklahoma City, and we'd go to wrestling. And, and that wasn't Olympic stuff. That wasn't OU and OSU stuff. That was big old, often chubby guys in, in, in spandex outfits with masks and lightning bolts and stuff, you know, on their mask. And they'd be wrestling and fighting and fighting and wrestling. And for a seven-year-old, that was about the most exciting place on planet Earth to be. You know, the highlight of the night for me was always when, when the bad guy would grab a chair and break it over the good guy's back. I mean, that was good stuff, right? And there was blood going everywhere. I mean, it was just awesome as a kid to be there on the fourth, fifth row and be center right watching all that stuff. And I loved it because I knew at the wrestling matches at the farmer's market, no matter how bad things got, in the end, the hero would win, right? No matter how bad it got, in the end, the hero won. The bad guy was vanished, vanquished, and the hero won. But that's not the way Jacob's wrestling match goes. They wrestle and they wrestle and they wrestle. And finally, the, the stranger says to Jacob, he says, the sun is coming. In, in the Hebrew uh, uh, language that this is translated from, it says the sun is com taking command of the sky. So the sun is coming, you need to let me go. And you wonder, is he wrestling with a vampire? What's the deal here? You know, when the sun comes out, is this person going to turn to dust? Well, what's the deal? And Jacob, well, Jacob is Jacob, right? Jacob is a thief and a trickster, someone who always gets what he wants uh, any way that he can. His name means grabby because he's always grabbing stuff. And he grabs hold of the stranger even tighter. He says, give me a blessing. Not letting you go till you give me a blessing. And there's something that happens. And Jacob is injured, probably with a blow below the belt, probably kind of thing. But Jacob is the grabber, and he just grabs on tighter. And he refuses to let go. Jacob says to the stranger, What's your name? The stranger says, Why do you need to know that? Sounds like two people fighting, right? Jacob says, I demand the blessing. I won't ever let you go. Well, he stole a blessing from, blessing from his daddy, stole a blessing from his brother. I mean, why not steal another one, right? And the man asks Jacob a question. He says, what is your name? What is your name? And this is the most important moment in the story. This is the heart of it all. This is what it's about. Because in this moment, when Jacob is in the dark night of his soul, when he's wrestling with his stranger, when his world seems to be caving in on him, he has to decide whether to be honest about who he is. You know, he could say anything. He'd say, I'm a king and my soldiers are coming. You better let me go. Or I'm a holy man and if you don't let go of me, you'll be cursed. He could just say, I'm Frank. Right? Right? It's the moment of truth. And Jacob speaks his name, which is a confession. I am Jacob. I am the thief. And the stranger says, and I will change your name to Israel, which means the one that struggles with El, God. And that El, that word for God, right there, it's not the general word everybody uses in the Bible. It's a very intimate and personal word. It's the name Leah used to speak to God. And then he is released. So who does Jacob wrestle with, right? I mean, there are a lot of possibilities when you think about it. He ran into a bunch of angels when he first got there. Maybe it's one of the angels. But that seems kind of unlikely, that just a mere mortal guy could wrestle with an angel and prevail. That doesn't make sense. Maybe it's Laban. We know Laban's furious with him. Not only has he stolen Laban's livestock, but as the story goes on, we find out that he's actually stole the deeds to Laban's land. Maybe it's Laban. But it seems unlikely. Laban is an old man. 
probably about 100 years old. He probably wouldn't last all night in a wrestling match. It's obvious. It has to be Esau, right? We know that Esau is coming to kill him. Maybe Esau has forded the stream, come across, and has wrestled him in the night. But the next chapter will tell us that the first time Esau and Jacob see each other is the next day. You have to go back to how the whole thing starts. It starts off with a joke that we don't get in the English translation. When, when Jacob first gets there, he, it says in your English translations, he forded the river. What it actually says in Hebrew is he forded the ford, the ford he was fording when he forded the ford, and forded it when he made his people ford, because they were fording, we all forded back and forth, we forded again. That's what it says in Hebrew, which is a Monty Python kind of a thing. When Jewish people read this text even today, they laugh at that part. Because what it says is he walked out halfway in the stream. He walked over here and went, no, I don't think I'm going to go that way. He walked back over to the other side. No, I don't think I'm going to go that way. No, I'm, gonna go, no, I'm not going to go that way. No, no, and he just does this over and over. And he's got all these hundreds of people, livestock, sheep, everything, following him as he does it. He's been in this horrible dilemma about what his life is, about who he is and how he should live. Directionless. Until this moment, when he finally confesses his name. The scripture, the Hebrew word for the person he wrestles with is ish. And we know the word, right? It's been all throughout the book of Genesis in the beginning. God created Adama, the earth person, the one made out of earth, right? People don't realize Adam is not a man's name. It's just a generic word. But later in the creation story, Ish becomes the name for the man and Isha, the name for the woman, when Eve is created. Jacob has been wrestling with man. What does that mean? I think it means that when we're in the dark night of our souls, when we're feeling hurt and broken and we don't know which way to turn, we have a battle with God. What we're really battling with is ourselves and our identity. Who we are. Who God is. And how we relate. Oh, Jacob will meet God, but it will be the next day when his brother embraces him, loves him, and forgives him, and pours out grace upon him. And he looks into Esau's face and says, in your face, I see the face of God. But on this night, Jacob is wrestling with himself. And it's only when he's honest about who he really is that he can receive the blessing of God. It will be in Jacob's voice that Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And discovers that God always joins us on the cross of our life. And that God always resurrects us from the graves we dig for ourselves. It's me praying night after night in Dallas, my God, what have you brought me to this place for? And then one night feeling overwhelmed with the presence of the God of God and empowered to do ministry for the next 35, 40 years. Only when I admitted, God, I need your help, was God able to give me the love and the affirmation that he so desperately wanted to share with me. This is how it works. The cross always comes before the resurrection. This is the word of God in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.